So close, yet so far. That is how I would describe the writing on Jujutsu Kaisen's female cast. If you click on this video, you're either sharing the same sentiment right now, or you are waiting to get deliciously angry at me for all the things I'm about to say. And I'm gonna be real, I started this script in June 14th, 2022. I hesitated a lot on writing this video. Nobody particularly likes hearing bad things about the things they like. And honestly, the biggest reason in reality was I didn't want to be disappointed in the story I so deeply loved. It only takes one look at my channel to know how much I love Jujutsu Kaisen. I wanted to give Jujutsu Kaisen one more chance, but there are no more chances. But I just want you to know that this isn't a complete write-off of Jujutsu Kaisen. I have really truly enjoyed the story, but for that reason, I want it to be better. Let's begin. Oh, and spoilers. Jujutsu Kaisen started off so well. It wrote the flawed woman who lives for money and her investments. It wrote the girl who so badly wanted to escape the countryside because her existence there whittled away at her so much that she'd rather risk her life. It wrote the girl who has been reliant on men and her beauty and always being saved. It didn't write just a girl because nobody should ever write just a girl because there is no such thing someone who lacks motivation for what is within themselves is not a character at all but a set piece notice how all of their motivations stem from within not externally Mei Mei wants money because she covets their security and power it brings Dobara covets freedom even at the cost of her own life when she said in her dying moment that it wasn't so bad deep down that is how she felt she would rather die I here that have lived an empty life in quietude. When Remy wanted to be saved and coddled, it was about her own inadequacy. It wasn't about the man who took care of her. It was about her being taken care of so that she can stop being afraid. Because when you really, really dig deep down to the root of behaviors, a lot of them stem from a desire that's innate in us. That is what makes people love these characters so much. Wait, Esper, I thought this was a video about how much Jujutsu Kaisen let down its entire female cast. Well, this is why it's so much more disheartening how it fell apart. While Gege nailed the different motivations, he failed to let those motivations affect the actual world and the plot. Instead, Jujutsu Kaisen wrote these compelling women with interesting stories and left them there without any development. Our first clue should have been when Nobara died. The only female in the trio died in Shibuya, or was written off essentially. And slowly, one by one, each of the female characters fell off, except for Mai and Maki. And let's actually talk about Mai. Mai Zenin is not who I would have thought to be the character who impacted my perception of the female characters in JJK, because I didn't expect her to have the most complete and fulfilling arc of any female character in the series. When we met her, she was kind of a bitch. She shot Nobara upon basically meeting her. But as the story went on, we learned that the trigger happy smack talking twin of Maki had a rather deep hit of despair that she was nursing. Fear of abandonment stemmed from her twin leaving her behind. Maki was the person that held her hand, the person that dragged her through life, and the person that was willing to give up everything for her, and the person she was willing to give everything up for. And she loved her sister so, so much, and her absence made her feel empty, and rightfully so. That feeling of emptiness is difficult, it is harrowing. There is a little bit of that fearful young Mai Zenin within all of us. At one point or another, if you have been subjected to the torment and wonder that is human connection, then you know that fear and pain of abandonment is something that sticks with you. Pain is a universal language and Jujutsu Kaisen spoke it beautifully with the Zenin sisters. That was the important thing about Jujutsu Kaisen for me. Not that it brought me a lot of pain, which it did, not that it brought me two of my biggest anime crushes that's not Quanchi, but rather the connection it forged. That experience of pain is not gender specific and is in fact quite ubiquitous, but giving that pain to a female character gave her depth. And that is important. 
Why that is important will become apparent in all the ways that I dissect Jujutsu Kaisen's treatment of its female cast. But we'll start with this. That made her relatable to everyone. And while people may think my annoying, the thread of connection from our common ground stays. She might be annoying, but she hurts and she loves just like me. That is the beauty of representation, especially for shonen where a lot of the rhetoric revolves around this being a story for guys. And as much as I'm just dying to discuss the misogyny in the Anamanga community. I truly don't have time for that in this video, especially when my friend Colleen already did an incredible dissection of this topic that is incredibly well researched. Part of the reason why I went through with writing this video was being inspired after watching their video, so I suggest you watch that. I'll link it at the end of this one. Let's just get this out of the way very quickly. I have trust that you guys, my audience, is very capable capable of having this nuanced discussion, okay? I think we've all built that trust between us, right? And anyone who thinks that shonen doesn't need nuanced female characters with story arcs just as full as their male counterparts are just justifying their misogyny with the shonen classification. Can we all agree on that? It's almost 2023 and I am tired. It doesn't really get much simpler than that. One plus one equals two. Every guy who these set of stories are supposedly written for will encounter a female human being at some point in their lives. And those same guys want women in their stories. Why is Nobara so missed? Why does everyone love Maki? Why is the internet calling out the shittiness of Yuki's death so critically? Everyone wants good female characters because people just like good characters in general. Because we have learned that stories feel fuller and better without these arbitrary contrary misogynistic nonsense. The same way that no one wants plot armor, no one wants a character that's treated more like a set piece. Because at the end of the day, the most paramount and fulfilling and important thing we have is human connection, which is honestly a downgrade because being able to summon a flying electric bird would have allowed me to pretend like I'm Ash Ketchum. But sorry, life's not fair and instead all we have is each other. So not telling the stories of other genders and people because it is not the demographic is a disservice to whom that story is supposedly for. And let me tell you, despite what the demographic says, these stories are for everyone. They don't ID you at the counter gatekeeping these stories. So why should you care about this person sitting at home watching this video? Yes, you. Because if you inundate even good people with enough rhetoric that women will be supporting characters and are only meant to be supporting characters who take second place and make sacrifices for the main characters or that women are simply love interests, they would inevitably internalize some of that. And it takes active effort to not think in that way. And correct that way of thinking. It takes being aware of the narrative that's being woven for you and active work to remove that line of thinking from your head because you have no reason to think that the words of your favorite stories harm you. They make you feel good. They help you escape. And in fact, your favorite stories are not bad. They are not evil. You don't need to be ashamed for liking them, even if they have inadequacies. I read all of the Twilight books. I own all of them. That story is not good. But boy, let me tell you, Tina Esper was invested. But we do have to recognize when they fall short of what they should be because there is a difference between reality and fantasy. The reason why we can suspend our disbelief for Gojo literally bending space and time and why I cannot suspend my disbelief that almost every woman in this story is either a support, sacrificed, or erased. There is a reason why even in fantasy, certain things stay the same way. Think of a time when the sky wasn't blue in any media you enjoy. There aren't many of them. No sunsets or nighttime doesn't count. I know at least one of you dickheads was thinking it. If you lived your whole life knowing that the sky is blue and one day a piece of media you watch insists that the sky is green, you would want an explanation as to why, right? Imagine a slice of life anime where the only thing weird was that the sky was green. It would become an elephant in the room. It might be a small elephant at first, but imagine eight episodes in and nobody has addressed it. And now it is a large elephant in the room. And everyone insists that 
who cares if the sky is green they just don't care but it detracts from your enjoyment of the show will someone please just tell you why the goddamn sky is green so at this point, you're probably like, that's broken. Sky's green. How does this relate to the point you're trying to make? We need certain pieces of reality to ground us, even in fictional worlds. Otherwise, it becomes too much to explain. The amount of it varies from where the scale is from fantasy to realistic. It sways from one side to the other, but there seems to be a trend of a general acceptance of how poorly written women can be because so much of it has been perpetuated over time normalized but noticing that small elephant grow larger and larger was my own experience but instead of it progressing over eight episodes it happened over the years for me it started early in high school when i began to get tired of fan service and then there were a few women that i could look to that inspired me and i couldn't connect to the media anymore because the media didn't see me i just saw the glaring hole in the center of it where it didn't see women as anything more than set pieces and i know that's a large generalization but there is something to be said that more than 10 years later i am still having to write this video essay representation is important that's why characters like my who provide a common thread is important because feelings of grief abandonment and pain are universal and having it portrayed in a female character forges that communication and humanizes female characters beyond the binary of love interest or self-sacrificing support character seeing parts of ourselves in those who don't immediately look or present the same way we do is important because it's how we connect as much as the 14 year old me needed a character I can aspire to be, the 14 year old boy also needed a woman's story that can help inspire him and feel connected to the literal almost other half of the population. Because when we all walk out of our rooms, we will meet people from all walks of life. We will meet Nobaras, we will meet Mai's, we will meet Yuki's, and in the very same way, we will meet Yuji's, Megami's, and Junpei's. Jujutsu Kaisen initially presented us with a wide range of characters. This is why Jujutsu Kaisen was lauded across the internet for its portrayal of its female cast as nuanced, in-depth, and most importantly, real. They weren't just facets of the universe to be used for advancing the stories of the main characters until they were. It seemed like they had their own philosophies they were standing for and fighting for. They were their own with motivations and personalities that people can relate to and cling to. And as a female reader, it was nice to see female characters who were more like me. It was nice to see female characters who weren't like me because spectrum matters. Because no matter what, I crave characters that I can learn from and connect with. Because while I'm never going to learn Limitless, I can still take a lesson from Nobara's speech to Yuji. I can still learn from young Gojo Satoru sitting fucking bummed out on the stairs of Jujutsu High that he can only save those that wish to be saved. Those are the lessons and stories I grew up with. I grew up with anime. From Doremi to Hunter Hunter, I watched it all growing up and to see the anime that got me back into loving anime after eight years or something of not watching it dropped the ball this hard. I was really bummed. I thought that Jujutsu Kaisen was putting female characters in a position where they're not just charms to dangle off the coattails of male characters, but real and true characters that stand on their own. When I first watched Jujutsu Kaisen, this brought me joy. After the disappointment I'd suffered from the media I'd abandoned years ago. But I was wrong. Until I read the manga and I read through Shibuya and I suffered through the calling game arc of Hakari just punching Kashimo a bunch and I started to doubt Jujutsu Kaisen. But I kept holding out hope. I told myself uh, I wasn't just about to suffer the same disappointment that my teenage self had suffered many years prior. I was too old and too tired for that shit. But it turns out I will be wrong again. <laughs> because I read Chainsaw Man and I wasn't super impressed, but I still thought it was better. Then I sat on it some more and the more I thought about it, the more apparent the flaws of Jujutsu Kaisen began to be something I could no longer ignore and make excuses for. But Chainsaw Man was a good story, but it didn't compel me like Jujutsu Kaisen compelled me. So I let those thoughts rest. 
And then I read Hell's Paradise and I loved it. This was an instance of where I needed the right thing to help me see how wrong the thing I had been holding in high esteem was. Jujutsu Kaisen's strong female cast was a facade. Jujutsu Kaisen does not deserve the praise that it gets. And this is all a bit overdramatic from a grown ass woman talking about anime and manga on YouTube. But these stories are designed to make us care. This is why Game of Thrones season eight wrenched a visceral disappointment across literally millions of people. That is why the petition for season eight to be redone was signed by 1.7 million people. 1.7 million. If you ever feel down about yourself, remember that you are not even close to disappointing that many people. These stories ask us to invest time, emotions, and thread parts of ourselves to the people that we see in these stories. To be callous to that investment is to lose the audience you have built. It's the same with YouTube. If I never valued your time that you spend in one of my videos, and I just sat here for an hour, talking to you about how I really love tea and all the intricacies of tea and my whole collection of tea, you would click off pretty fucking quick because it's not for you. It's the same thing with shows, movies, books, and manga. Ultimately, that experience is for you. Whether you are seeking super sick fights or narratives that bring you on a journey, you want it to be fulfilling. And week after week, Jujutsu Kaisen just brought me disappointment because Gege has convinced me that his characters are important. In fact, he has implored us, whether consciously or subconsciously, to realize that his characters and their motivations are important to the plot and to the story. He has drilled into us time and again that the story flows because of the motivations of the characters. Gojo's innate desire to save everyone gave us Okatsu and Yuji. Tengen's passiveness has resulted in the ideal situation for the collapse of Jujutsu society. This is why they tell you that you should never become the only person that can do your job. Especially if that job is keeping literally all of Japan's barriers intact. Gege is the main perpetrator of the rhetoric that his characters are important. That's why there's a million threads on Reddit on how Nobara can come back because she is important and she is missed. Gege wanted us to get invested in his characters. That much is apparent in the writing. But even with all of this, he has failed to continuously treat his female characters with the same care and treatment that their male counterparts have received and all I do mean all of his female characters have fallen into the category of support, sacrifice, or erasure. And the ending of Yuki Tsukuma's arc is what put the final nail in the coffin for me. To highlight this point, I want to talk about Chainsaw Man. Yes, really. And I promise this is going somewhere because once upon a time, I insisted that Jujutsu Kaisen was the end all be all best shonen manga right now. But one of my mutuals, Lucas, kept insisting that I read Chainsaw Man, that it was great better than Jujutsu Kaisen in fact. Now Lucas, no offense if you're watching this, but I wasn't sure that Lucas and I had the same values on what made a manga great. After all, Denji's huge goal was to touch a boob. Uh, I would also like to touch a boob, but that was not my main goal in life. So I didn't see how much in common I had with Denji really, but I powered through mostly fueled by Lucas screaming at me to finish it as if I had homework. So I kept reading. This is where I realized that Fujimoto had a plot driven story. While Gege implores us that his characters are important while treating all of his female story arcs like garbage, Fujimoto said, I will put all of my characters through the ringer, so help me God if it helps me tell my story in the way I want it to. It's a direct quote, by the way. Look it up. In a plot driven story, the characters are pieces that the story is conveyed through. They don't need to grow. Not to say that they don't, but they don't need to. There are a lot of great character arcs in Chainsaw Man, but the way they live and die will serve the story. Their deaths are harrowing, 
but not hollow. I won't go too in depth with Chainsaw Man because I still need to reread it, but there is a distinct feeling of the characters as a medium to tell the story that is already decided. This is not a bad thing, by the way. I, I really like it. This is just a different way of writing and one that fits the really unforgiving world of Chainsaw Man incredibly well. When your best friend dies, the world keeps on spinning and it doesn't stop. And you either keep going or you just break down and roll over. This is what made me realize that Gege was writing his female characters poorly, actually, because he wrote them differently. His story is character driven, but only for the men. They affect the story. They were evolving and growing and their motivations moved the plot along. For example, without Kenjuku, there would be nothing. The story relies on Kenjuku, therefore Kenjuku has plot armor. I'm not even going to bother discussing to you the physics of why you can't just survive a black hole like that and why it is such a deus ex machina to have that power. But anyway, Gege writes his female characters as plot devices. He writes the female characters as if his story is plot driven. If this isn't making sense to you, think of it this way. His female characters are just written for the plot. And that part of the plot just happens to be something that happens to the male characters. This is where the problem lies. The female characters are tools that don't affect the story. They are not treated as importantly as the male characters in the story. Their trajectories affect the other male characters, not the plot. I'll talk about it more in depth in just a bit, but this is a really, really, really disappointing realization. I know some of you are thinking that it makes sense the way things go down, that Gege has justified his story to us, that he has left enough clues for those things to make sense when he writes them later down the road. And you know what? To those people I say, you're right. You see, Gege Akutami does a beautiful job of intertwining clues within his story to justify them later on. That's part of the reason why I really love Jujutsu Kaisen. However, there is an important process that has been neglected in that argument. Gege is still in charge of planning the arcs of each character, especially if you are writing a character-driven story. Here is one of the biggest giveaways that Gege is not emphasizing character writing with the women of JJK. We are 200 odd chapters later to the arc that Gege has planned and the arc is devoid of any woman that continues to stand in any sort of significance to the main story and before you cry Maki I will get to that later I know I've been saying that since the beginning of the video but I will talk about it Here's the thing, it doesn't matter how well you foreshadow the things you do if you write them into a shitty arc that's still bad writing. So let's go through Gege's female characters. Let me show you how Gege has only let his male characters affect the story and how his female characters are reduced to support, sacrifice, or erasure. You've heard it enough times now. Momo was a support, still a support. Granted, she's not a main character, but why did she get a random cameo that was never followed through? Was it because we hadn't seen a female character since Miwa's random cameo? And uh, speaking of Miwa, big time erasure and support. Her story arc was erased. She got one panel and her story never was touched on again. And this is another part where it's evident that the fandom loves the female characters of Jujutsu Kaisen. They want good female characters because everybody wanted to see what Miwa was going to do. And her story is compelling. Miwa is a protector by nature. Imagine the fury of someone who so deeply wants to protect. This is the girl who stood up to Kenjuku, knowing full well that she was 99.9999% gonna die. Imagine the heights it could take them and the lows they could haul themselves out of just by the sheer desire to protect if given the opportunity to rise up. She was also used to humanize Mekamaru, who she fully accepted as the weird robot that he was. He betrayed his friends. He gave information to the enemy for his own selfish reasons. And she suffered the loss and served to make him more desirable. It's okay that he committed the terrible acts because he did it with good intentions. Mekamaru is just simply not as desirable without Miwa. And Ura Ume, we barely know anything about her. She's a support. She literally just follows Kenjuku around. And also, she's a literal follower of Sukuno. Ura, oh my god, Ura. 
sacrifice the only one maimed in that fight between her yuta and ryu so that yuta can gain a new technique yuta had their little moment while she was shunted off to the corner after yuta got to copy her power despite having the more compelling power and story that again was never touched on again ryu got the spotlight in that fight angel erasure we know too little about her despite her presence being the sole purpose of going into the culling game but instead we got a six chapter arc of hikari just punching kashimo like a lot super hard angel right now is being used to bring the attention back to megami and yuji and sukuna it's a little too quick to judge because it's early in her arc because she just showed up somehow at the end of the culling games and now we get to mai mai was a sacrifice for maki to reach her full potential her story in a vacuum is actually quite impactful but even overlaid with a pattern here it's still impactful she died for her sister in a well architected arc she is the only female character that gege seemed to write really well but only only because her path was already one of sacrifice and having no desires or aspirations besides standing in her sister's side that's literally her character she did that one thing really well and it's disappointing and i would forgive this one because there are people who do sacrifice themselves for others but well maki and yuki get their own section so let's talk about it in a second obara was sacrificed she was someone who so valued freedom that she risked her life for it and now she's presumably dead to push yuji to his growth it was the combined presence of toto and her death that elevated yuji to defeat mahito she died and it wasn't even yuji honoring her camaraderie that brought him back it was toto shaking shaking him up her sole purpose there was to rile up yuji's emotions this was also immediately after she had been revealed to be the natural enemy of mahito this would have been an excellent time to power her up but instead she died so do you see all of these dead end arcs that follow this pattern of support sacrifice and erasure way too neatly there is not a single female character besides maki that got a power up they were all promptly written off or extinguished this is not about a side character or main character or how powerful they are yuji wasn't powerful in the beginning it is the difference in the way that the writing has been done that has a gender divide and the opportunities that weren't given for female characters to power up and be a part of the actual story. Yes, there are male characters that have been used in the same way, but when largely the main cast that drives the story is already 100% male, it is not a valid argument. And you know what? To solidify my point, let's talk about Nobara versus Yuji's development within the story. Also, I swear, I'm not edging you in the whole Maki thing. I just. I need to make this point here and it's the only place that makes sense to put it, okay? And look, I made you this thing. Woo, distraction. Let's scroll back to the very, very, very beginning of the manga where we take the journey from zero to Shibuya with these characters. Let me just quickly walk you through how this chart works. So we have obviously Nobara and Yuji on one side, and then in the middle, we have the arc, and then we have a line that is kind of a mixture of both their potential, basically their efficacy in battle. We start off with Nobara on a slightly higher level than Yuji because she received training from her grandmother, who is a former sorcerer. Yuji starts off in like this weird middle ground where he's not quite a normal human being we know that now because one of his parents is actually a sorcerer from here nobara and yuji both have sort of a baseline within their power nobara says higher because she has received training and she has an actual curse technique and curse technique control whereas yuji has a little bit of a bump up when he consumes the finger not because he really gains anything from sukuna but mostly because his consumption of the finger awakens his own cursed energy 
potential. So now we move on to Fearsome Womb. In this arc, we don't really get to see a lot from Nobara, so I gave her a very slight curve because this is still experience points in her pocket. And Yuji here has a training arc with Gojo. That leads into the Mahito arc with Nanami. In this arc, Nobara isn't even present, but there was mention of her training with Panda and the second years. So I gave her like a very, very slight slope to her improvement because of that. Really, the focus here is the training with Nanami. And then we have the Kyoto Goodwill arc, which is enormous, 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 enormous for Yuji because Toto trains him. But before we get to that, let's first talk about Nobara because Nobara has one fight in this whole arc and it is with momo and you might remember this fight between momo and nobara because of the incredibly iconic discussion that the two of them had as to the expectations of jujutsu world on female sorcerers and that was when nobara had her clap back of i love dressing up and looking beautiful i love being strong i'm nobara kugisaki I don't know if Gega is playing some sort of 4D chess over here, but both of them have a point. Nobara shouldn't have to worry about guys versus girls, and yet still Momo's point holds true. There is a certain societal expectation of women to be beautiful, to be perfect, to first get that chance to sit at the table. And while Nobara's sentiment is nice, not so much now and, you know, I'm making this video about how that failed to actually make a difference. But anyway, moving on to Yuji. Toto was an incredibly important mentor for Yuji because not only did Toto teach Yuji about how curse energy flows within his body and how to achieve that harmony, he set him up for incredible success. He says to Yuji that no matter what happens, if you can't use Black Flash, then I'll watch you die. When the stakes are at their highest, that is when Yuji performs the best. Understanding this brought Yuji to a whole new level, and he had Toto expedite that process for him. If you've not yet noticed the pattern here, I will point it out for you. All of Yuji's improvements happen in spikes. He trained with Gojo. He trained with Nanami. He trained with Toto, which ultimately culminated to the Black Flash. And here's the thing. Look at Nobara's improvement right now. It's a gradual slope up, except for the death painting arc, but Nobara has never had an on-screen mentor. Gojo has never even reached out to Nobara to help her out with her studies, with her power. Even Megami had a one-on-one -on -one with Gojo and, you know, having grown up with Gojo as well. I don't know if Megami actually utilized that to its full potential. However, being the ward of the strongest sorcerer probably has its own perks. Nobara, on the other hand, never had an on-screen mentor, never had anybody to actually show her the ropes and guide her to her improvement. Her line is a gradual slope up because every time Nobara fights, she innovates. Nobara always has something new up her sleeve, something new that she came up with on her own. And I think that pretty much sums up the difference between the treatment of of the female characters in Jujutsu Kaisen versus the male characters. So I'm just gonna go over the rest of this chart very briefly for the death painting and Shibuya arc because Nobara achieved Black Flash on her own. She achieved it without a Toto helping her and helping her understand and pushing her. She pushed herself. We got the reveal that she is Mahito's natural enemy, and that is normally where you would power up a character. And instead, that is when she died. So if it wasn't gonna happen then for Nobara, for a female character who is arguably a main character, when will it happen? And I know, you're screaming Maki. You're screaming Maki. I'm so close. We're almost there. And you know what? I'm all for Gege proving me wrong. Like, prove me wrong, Gege. Prove me wrong. But yeah, I made this whole chart to uh, prove a point. Also, I hope you could read my handwriting. A little bit late for that, but I hope you can read it. Yeah. Now, it is actually time that we talk about Maki. 
Finally, Maki was a great female character and the past tense there is intentional. Maki in the beginning had purpose and goals. Maki wanted to make room for herself and her sister. And when that was no longer possible, her quest became to honor Mai's wish of destroying everything, which she did consider everything destroyed. But now she is a spiritual successor to Toji. She is an inheritor of the heavenly restriction. And now I can't see a chapter of Maki fighting without a call back to Toji. And yeah, sure, Toji is the original heavenly restriction user and he has really nice abs, but what is with the heavy handed approach of referencing him at every opportunity? Her advancement is attributed to understanding how Toji did it. Maki is the embodiment of a masculine female character that gets to stick around because she is a proxy for a male character. Why is one of the supposed best female characters in Jujutsu Kaisen right now always presented side by side constantly to Toji? Maki is a means for Toji to stay relevant in the story. Jujutsu Kaisen is using Maki as a spiritual successor to him. He might be jacked and hot, but just let the man stay dead. I would have been okay with my sacrifice had it been maybe that we got to focus on Maki instead of Toji, but Giga is not writing female narratives. Maki's sister died. Her whole structure system has been shattered. We never even see her shed a tear for Mai. We haven't seen her contemplate who she is without her twin and her family and the life that she wanted. We've seen Yuji already have multiple breakdowns where he gets in touch with who he is and what he wants. Maki being presented as clinical when that's not her. Her motivations are so largely emotional. They're vengeful of the clan that turned her away. So why hasn't she had a moment of catharsis? And you know what? I tried to look that over, but what made it so blatant and so in my goddamn face was Yuki Tsukumo's disappointing arc. I alluded on Twitter a little while ago that I had some choice words for the Kenjuku versus Yuki fight, but I held my tongue, which doesn't happen often because I wanted to give Jujutsu Kaisen another shot. But like I said, there are no more second chances. Yuki is a character that has been with us since the very beginning. Senior to Geto and Gojo, a special great sorcerer herself with an interesting quest and ideology. Clearly very, very powerful. Clearly a force to be reckoned with. And someone who is incredibly independent. Someone who is a former star plasma vessel. Someone who Kenjuku himself was unsure if he could beat. Her arc was written into a dead end where, you guessed it, she sacrificed herself in a very badass way but sacrifice nonetheless. And you would think that a special grade sorcerer with incredible power sacrificing herself, creating an incredible display of power would surely injure Kenjuku heavily, right? Put him in mortal danger? Nope. Here's why the treatment that Yuki Tsukuma got was utter bullshit. Yuki Tsukuma had one of the strongest internal motivators of the people we know. She was the antithesis to Kenjuku, a perfect foil for him, I would argue. They could have had a great rivalry with literally opposing views of how the world should be and become. Yuki would have made a fantastic and powerful anti-hero. She is not on Kenjuku's side. She is not on the side of Jujutsu society either. In fact, she is very much against the way they do things. She has been marching to the beat of her own drum since the start, researching and pursuing ideals of heavenly restriction, which clearly exists in this very powerful alternative to cursed energy and worth pursuing. But instead of writing that arc, that story, Gege never wrote progress into it, never even put Maki and her in a conversation together. But instead, she served as a tool to get Geto's body to, and I'm not even kidding, finally joined the shirtless club. <sighs> she had so many storylines and so many facets of her personality unexplored. Yuki Tsukumo was so fucking interesting. We never got to even see her talk about her research or her interests, but we got to see her cheerleading Choso to live on. Look, I love Choso. But how did we get to the point of the story where one of the best sorcerers in the world was sacrificing herself for him. She doesn't know him. Why is she so invested? This goes beyond feeling sorry for somebody. Everyone has a sob story. And while it wasn't a direct sacrifice, there was overtones of that. While it could be argued that this was a byproduct of the situation, Choso made it out unscathed and Yuki got ripped in two. 
Well, Kendrick never took that initial fight seriously. If he's this super powerful, and then when Choso came back a second time, he should have been taking that fight seriously and handedly taken down Choso, who was just dividing his attention from the real opponent that is Yuki. Probably because Chosa has more of an arc that Yuki has ever had, he got to survive. She has remained a mystery this whole time, only to be extinguished before any of the answers about her could be talked about. Why was her research never talked about when heavenly restriction is still clearly an important part of the world? Why didn't she invest in self-preservation for someone who has been investing in her own independent projects this whole time? Why was her domain never shown? Why was her power so distinctly opposite to Kenjiku's stolen ability that it feels almost as if that fight was written backwards to get to that point. Look, dude, if this doesn't convince you that the female characters in Jujutsu Kaisen are just plot devices, then I don't know. This essay is like over 6,000 words. <sighs> Even the fight had such an obvious deus ex machina, from the technique to the injury to her arm that the fight clung onto as the very reason that she failed to kill Kenjuku and gave him opportunities to survive. And the reason why she even ended up there was Gege's writing imperative. He sees Kenjuku as a character, he sees Yuki as a tool. Yuta could have stayed behind, but he was never going to be sacrificed because Gege probably has a further role planned out for him. Part of that was stealing Uro's technique. Yuki's role was to get Geto to reveal lore about Yuji's mother. Even her power is perfectly fit for it. It doesn't matter how well justified the reasons are when the end result is the same. Female characters who are written into dead end endings of being support, sacrifice, or erased. If Yuki doesn't die here, which is a long shot, because when was the last time you survived a trip down a black hole? The Saiyan Interstellar. She specifically says that this level of mass also affects her. So I'm just going to consider her dead unless she magically revives in the next chapter, which would be oh so terrible writing. I'm getting ahead of myself. So as I was saying, even if Yuki doesn't die here, the intent hasn't changed either. For the whole past 200 chapters, there was no exploration on Yuki's story arc, on her motivations, on how perfect of a foil she is to Kenjuku. But instead, we didn't get to see her domain. We saw her get her ass beat and then see her go on a self-sacrificing arc. Things that are very much specifically not in line with the personality we have been made to expect. I'm supposed to care about the characters. This is not good writing. Nobara and Yuki never got their stories explored in a meaningful way. They never got story arcs that gave them opportunities to better themselves, and they never got a chance to make a difference in the stories. They're adorned in all of this mystery and intrigue, but they are quickly extinguished before they can truly become anything. That is the disappointment of the writing of Jujutsu Kaisen's female cast. It is not that the writing fails to make sense. It is that the female characters are written compellingly on the surface, but it quickly becomes evident that they are simply ornate charms and the coattails of their male counterparts. Fancy, ornate, and on the surface, well-written charms are still just charms nonetheless. I really had higher hopes for this manga, but I now realize that the ways I had been feeling about Jujutsu Kaisen's female cast weren't outliers. It was a pattern of how women were written within the story, when they had served their purpose of the advancement of the male characters that they are written for. Once that goal was achieved, they are quickly disposed of. And to top off this whole thing with the irony cherry, Kenjuku survived using a technique he stole from a woman whose body he used to make Yuji. I cannot make this shit up. I am so tired of this shit, man. Anyway, hi, post editing Esper here to close out the video. I just wanted to say a special thanks to you for watching this video and to my patron and YouTube members for supporting my channel. Jir, Johnny Aguilar, and JJK Hyperfixation. Thank you for your support. My Patreon should be like here somewhere and also in the description below if you feel like tossing money my way every month to support the channel. But just for this month, I will make a free Patreon video so you don't have to sub, you don't have to do anything. It'll just be up on my Patreon of a Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want me to discuss, uh, you want to ask me, put them down in the comments below of this video and that video will then be available on my Patreon soon. All right, thank you for watching, subscribe.
I'll see you in the next one. Bye.